This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely introduction. It's very kind of you. And yes, you have probably noticed that I'm not from here. Any, sure you probably gathered where I am from. I'm from the United Kingdom. Um, it is a real pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, I've come over from New York from uh, a deep snowstorm into this uh, gorgeous uh, California sunshine, so I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I particularly want to thank Dr. Wallach for the invitation and for graciously hosting me, for Professor Hecht, for the lovely introduction and for uh, inviting me here this evening and for the Taubman Foundation for making this all possible. Um, so I'm here to talk to you this evening about the Palestinian minority in Israel. And since the Palestinian minority in Israel are rarely spoken about, I think it is important at the outset to clarify who exactly I'm talking about. Uh, when most people use the term Israeli, most people think of Israelis, they have in mind Israeli Jews, right? Most people automatically equate the two. So Israeli simply means uh, an Israeli Jew. And in fact, 25% of Israel's population are not Jewish, 25% of Israel's citizens. Of that 25%, the majority of those are Arab citizens. Actually, 20% of Israel's citizens are Arab. 20%. So in other words, one in five Israeli citizens are Arab. And this is the population that I'm going to be talking about this evening. I'm going to be talking specifically about a subset of this population. I'm talking about Palestinians. Not all Arab citizens of Israel identify themselves as Palestinian. The vast majority do, but not all of them. Um, so if we take the Arab population as a whole, we have to distinguish between Druze, Druze Arab, who do not identify themselves as Palestinian, and the other majority of Arabs who do. This is something about 90%. Now, when I talk about Arab citizens as Palestinian, this is a term that um, is also kind of unfamiliar to many people. Many people, particularly in Israel, and outside of Israel, use the term Israeli Arabs when referring to Israel's Arab citizens. They talk about Israeli Arabs. Um, well, that's a very problematic term. It's problematic because it does not cohere with how Arabs see themselves. Most Arabs do not identify as Israeli Arabs or Arab Israelis. They identify as members of the Palestinian nation. Over survey, over survey, when asked to define yourself, they will define themselves as Palestinian. And so I think it's important, before we discuss anything else about this population, to acknowledge this uh, aspect of their identity, to acknowledge that they are citizens of Israel, Arabs, and Palestinians. And so for that reason, I'll be using the term Palestinian minority or Palestinian citizens of Israel, rather than the more common term used in Israel of Israeli Arabs, because I think it uh, doesn't do justice to how members of this minority see themselves. So I'm talking then about 20% of Israel's citizens, the vast majority of whom are Muslim, about 80%, and 10% uh, Christian, 10% Druze. Okay, what I'm going to do this evening is basically uh, argue that this community and its status in Israel and its relationship with Israeli Jews and with the state of Israel is a critical issue. It's a critical issue, a major problem that needs to be addressed. Um, it is an issue that has for too long been ignored. It's been ignored not only by Israeli governments, by successive Israeli governments, by Israeli Jews, by Arab governments, and by the international community as a whole. So when most people think of the Palestinian issue, 
When most think, people think of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, what they have in mind is Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. Perhaps they might also think about Palestinians uh, in the diaspora, Palestinian refugees. What they generally don't think of uh, is this population within Israel, its particular problems and its particular challenges. And so I'm here to kind of focus on this community and to discuss the problems that they face and um, how I think some of these problems can be ameliorated, or is, if not completely resolved. So I want to begin by talking about um, what are What's the problem? Very briefly to go into some history. When the State of Israel was established in May of 1948, it viewed itself as fulfilling the Zionist dream of establishing an independent Jewish state in the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Despite the fact that the country had a mixed population of Jews and Palestinians, even after the vast departure of majority of Palestinian population, um, only 10% of Palestinians remained in, in the state of Israel. That's about 160,000 at the outset. The, the political elite in Israel established a Jewish state, uh, an ethnic Jewish state, a state geared toward uh, the interests of the Jewish majority, rather than, say, a liberal democracy uh, based upon full individual equality and neutrality, of the, to, sorry, and neutrality of the state toward all ethnic groups, or, say, a binational state. So although the state committed itself at the outset to maintaining, in the words of its Declaration of Independence, quote, full social and political equality of all its citizens, from the outset, the Palestinian minority uh, were regarded as something of an unwelcome and alien presence in, in the state. Now, of course, this in the context of the continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the conflict between Israel and its neighbors placed Israel's Palestinian citizens in a very precarious and vulnerable position, as they were viewed as a potential fifth column in this conflict. Um, so from the outset, they were regarded as a, with a degree of suspicion and regarded as somehow the other within Israeli society. Uh, and nothing signifies this more clearly than the establishment of a military government over Palestinian population, or over Arab inhabited areas within Israel, which lasted until 1966. So the establishment of this military government automatically marked out Israel's Palestinian citizens as a separate and essentially unequal. Well, fast forward uh, 60, years or so, and the Palestinian community today in Israel is no longer the completely ghettoized minority that it was during Israel's first few decades, but it remains a distinctive, unassimilated, self-conscious minority on the margins of Israeli society and politics. To this day, Jews and Palestinians generally reside in different neighborhoods, attend different schools, and meet only in the workplace, and then only as a boss and a worker. Um, moreover, Palestinians in Israel remain subject to the deep suspicion and at times outright hostility of members of the Jewish majority, and they continue to be widely perceived as a security threat and a potential fifth column in Israel's conflict with the Palestinians. Now, this perception, I want to point out, um, has been reinforced, particularly in recent years, by the actions of uh, and the statements of Palestinian politicians in Israel. So the fact that some Palestinian politicians go to states that are at war with Israel, like Syria, um, and make comments uh, that are perceived to be supportive of Syria or Hezbollah uh, reinforces this perception uh, that they are a disloyal minority. So in some sense, the situation hasn't changed a great deal. But in other respects, things have changed a lot. Um, Palestinians, and it's important to note this, um, have undoubtedly benefited, undoubtedly benefited from living in Israel. If we take it in terms of their living standards, there has been huge improvements. And just a couple of uh, measurements, if we look at health and education as two indicators of, of living standards, um, mortality rates have um, declined precipitously uh, fallen by two-thirds since Israel's establishment. Life expectancy has increased by 30 years. So huge advances in, in health. Uh, more infant mortality rates have been slashed. If we take education, uh, 
In the past, at the beginning, very few Arab school children, Arab children attended school. Now, almost all of them do. Very few uh, graduated high school. Now, more and more Arabs are graduating high school and more and more going to university. So there's been a huge advance in terms of education, particularly important for Palestinian women in Israel. Palestinian women in Israel are now better educated than their male counterparts. So there's been huge advances in that area as well. Nevertheless, although there's been huge advances made, uh, Palestinian educational attainment inside Israel still lags far behind that of Jewish educational attainment. And this is kind of generally the story. I, Whatever the area you, you look at, you see that while there have been real material advances for Palestinians in Israel, compared to their Jewish counterparts, they still lag far behind. Um, if we look at income levels, if we look at uh, poverty levels, it's the same story. Income levels have increased, uh, employment opportunities have increased, but they're still far behind those of their Jewish counterparts. Now, I want to be clear, the reasons for this do not lie solely with Israeli government policies. Right? The fact that uh, Palestinians and Israel are economically marginalized, are disproportionately poor, something like, on average, 50% of Palestinians in Israel are below the poverty line. Not all of this can be attributed to uh, the policies of Israeli governments, but some of it certainly can. Some of it certainly can. The fact is that they have been traditionally neglected and in some cases discriminated against throughout their history as citizens of Israel. The same applies politically. On the one hand, we can say Palestinians in Israel enjoy more uh, rights and freedoms than do Palestinians certainly in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and also more rights and freedoms compared to Arabs in the Middle East as a whole. But again, compared to their Jewish counterparts, they are politically marginalized. To date, no Arab party, no Arab political party, has ever participated in an Israeli coalition government. And basically, an unofficial rule continues to exclude Arab parties from the government, which means that if you're not a member of the coalition government, you're really excluded from real political power in Israel. Arabs sit in the Knesset, Arab political parties are in the Knesset, but by being excluded from the possibility of joining a coalition government, they lack real political power. So as I speak, there are coalition negotiations going on in Israel to this, at the moment about the formation of the next government. There's no possibility that one of the Arab parties, there are three Arab parties in the current Knesset, will become or will be invited to become a member of the coalition government. Even if they happen to agree on some policy issues, they are automatically excluded from political power. So basically, um, Palestinians in Israel remain economically and politically marginalized and in an inferior position compared to their Jewish counterparts. Um, in a sense, they are separate and unequal. Um, they also face discrimination, sometimes formal, some more often informal. In terms of formal discrimination, uh, the most significant, uh, the most well-known are Israel's citizenship laws. Essentially, um, the 1950 Law of Return confers automatic citizenship, the right to immigrate to Israel, to Jews anywhere in the world, uh, whereas Israel's foundational citizenship law of 1952 um, does not allow Palestinians to immigrate to Israel. In fact, even if you marry uh, a, a Palestinian citizen of Israel and you're a Palestinian from the West Bank, it is not possible for you to live with your spouse inside Israel. Other laws give, um, although not formally discriminating against Palestinians, inf uh, informally can give preferences to Jews. So for instance, uh, there's a host of quasi-governmental organizations that have some official status in Israel, like the Jewish National Fund, which controls uh, land, um, which are set up to serve the interests of Jews in accordance with uh, the Zionist uh, project. And, and because Palestinians cannot benefit from these organizations and their, their mandate is to serve uh, Jewish interests, Palestinians necessarily are excluded. 
Then there were things like the use of military service as a condition for receiving lands, uh, land and benefits, government benefits. Uh, with the exception of the Druze who do serve in the army, Palestinian citizens of Israel do not serve in the army and are therefore uh, prevented from receiving these benefits. Palestinian inhabited towns um, generally receive less inc uh, allocations from uh, the central government in terms of their budget. Palestinians are routinely stopped at the Israeli airport uh, when they wish to leave the country and subject to invasive uh, security procedures. Uh, Palestinian towns don't have um, a project, uh, don't have master plans that allow legal housing to be built, resulting in overcrowding, the difficulty to obtain permits, uh, resulting in house demolitions because their uh, homes are built uh, without permits. Um, there are Bedouin villages that are unrecognized and as a result of which don't receive access to electricity and water. I can go on and on. Uh, the point is that uh, there are many ways in which, on a day-to-day -day basis, Palestinians uh, feel uh, discriminated against and feel that they're essentially treated unequally. In addition to these formal and informal acts of discrimination, there's also social bias and prejudice that Palestinians in Israel face. Uh, if you're a university student and you're attending a, uni a university, you might find it difficult to, to rent an apartment when you give your name and the uh, landlord hears that it's an Arab name. Um, it might be difficult to get a job in a company because the company gives preference to veterans of military service. These kinds of things collectively, cumulatively, add up to a sense of feeling discriminated against, feeling marginalized, feeling excluded. So, the Palestinian community as a whole harbors a deep sense of grievance. They feel deprived compared to Jewish citizens, rejected and marginalized by Israeli Jewish society, and unfairly treated by the state. Unsurprisingly, they've reacted to this by growing increasingly politicized over the years. Uh, in the first few decades of Israel's existence, the Palestinian minority was politically quiescent. But in recent years, they've become more and more politically mobilized and active, more and more uh, open in expressing their opposition to the status quo. And this politicization, this mobilization of the Palestinian minority has really reached its zenith in, in, in the last few years. More than ever before, members of the Palestinian minority um, are denouncing what they see as their second class status in Israeli society. In particular, younger members of the Palestinian minority. They feel more secure in Israel. Uh, they're more educated thanks to the benefits and educational advancement that I mentioned before. And therefore, they're more outspoken in protesting what they see as their second class status. In addition to demanding full equality within Israel, Palestinian opposition to the status quo has increasingly taken the form of denouncing Zionism, rejecting Israel's claim to be a democracy, and demanding that Israel cease to be a Jewish state. More and more Palestinians believe that they will never be treated equally, fairly, as long as Israel defines itself as a Jewish state. And so the central demand, the central political demand of the Palestinian minority today is for the redefinition of the state of Israel. So that is no longer a Jewish state, but um, in the words of uh, one Palestinian political party, becomes a state for all its citizens. Um, needless to say, this demand for essentially the abolition of Israel as a Jewish state is a demand that Israel's Jewish majority um, doesn't exactly welcome. Right? They regard this as a, uh, a serious threat, and they adamantly oppose this demand. So the divide between Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel is the deepest and most problematic divide within the country. There are many divides that we can talk about in Israeli society. Often people pay attention to the divide between religious and secular Jews. That divide pales in, in significance compared to the divide between Jewish and Palestinian citizens. Um, while other divides, while other domestic cleavages have narrowed or at least been managed, the Jewish-Palestinian cleavage has deepened and is continuing to deepen. There was a period of time where relations improved during, in the early 90s at the beginning of the Oslo peace process under the Rabin government, but uh, since then, relations have deteriorated, especially over the past dozen years. 
and a turning point in this respect um, were the events of October 2000, shortly after the beginning of the Second Intifada, the so-called Al-Aqsa Intifada, when Palestinians inside Israel, partly in solidarity with Palestinians in the territories and partly to protest their own conditions, uh, staged large demonstrations and protests inside Israel. This was in October 2000. And as was in the course of these demonstrations, 13 Palestinian demonstrators were shot, killed by the Israeli police. Uh, this event is an open wound in the relationship between the state and the Palestinian minority. Um, and since then, attitudes on both sides have uh, worsened. Attitudes and perceptions have worsened. So the radical political views are gaining ground. Um, we can see this uh, on the Palestinian side by the growth in support for the uh, Islamic movement, particularly the northern branch of the Islamic movement led by uh, a, a very fiery demagogue named, by the name of Raid Salah. Um, he is perhaps the most popular Palestinian leader now inside Israel. On the other side, on the Jewish side, we can see the rise of um, Avigdor Lieberman who the, was the foreign minister, now is uh, under a corruption investigation, so he's uh, stepping down. But uh, the rise of his political party, Yisrael Beitenu, um, campaigning on quite an explicitly anti-Arab platform, again indicates the, the worsening of political attitudes, the radicalization that's happening on both sides. Basically, extremists within both communities are, are fanning the flames of hatred and becoming more prominent. And as extremists on one side uh, gain influence, they, they in turn bolster the extremists on the other side. So there's a kind of vicious circle taking place where the radicalism of one feeds the radicalism of the other. Now I want to be clear, most Palestinians and most Jews in Israel are still politically moderate. Both, on both sides there is a support for coexistence. However, the political dynamics within both communities, Palestinians becoming much more nationalistic, asserting their Palestinian national identity and demanding rights as Palestinians, and Israeli Jews becoming less tolerant of Palestinians in Israel, um, suggests, points to a growing conflict between these two groups. Fear and mistrust on both sides is very high. Palestinians fear uh, infringement of their civil rights, violence by the state and by Jewish citizens. They fear that their citizenship itself might be stripped from them. And they fear even being expelled from the state. And a fear, of course, that, that we can date back to the events of 1948, the Nakba, as Palestinians define it. Um, Jews also have fears. Jews uh, look at Palestinians as both security and demographic threats. They fear the spread of radicalism within the Palestinian minority, whether in the form of growing Palestinian nationalism or Islamism, and they perceived security risk this poses to Israel, especially in the event of another Palestinian intifada or Arab-Israeli war. They also fear um, Palestinian demographic growth. They fear that as Palestinians increase their share of Israel's, Jewish popula uh, Israel's population, they will eventually swamp and outnumber uh, Jews within the Jewish state and thereby nullify Israel as a Jewish state. So there are fears on both sides. And these fears are obviously reinforced and exacerbated by the continuation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One can't look at the issue of Palestinian Jewish relations inside Israel without also acknowledging the impact that the wider Jewish-Palestinian conflict has upon majority-minority relations. This isn't just a, a relationship between a majority and a minority. This is a relationship between a majority and a minority which is part of a Palestinian nation that is at war with the state of Israel. So the conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, contributes to this uh, problem in a number of ways. First of all, to take the attitudes of Israeli Jews. Israeli Jews um, see the Palestinian minority primarily in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Right. Um, so it's because of the, Palestine, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that they perceive Israeli Arabs as a security threat and a fifth column. And the fear and suspicion that they have towards Arabs uh, makes them essentially less willing to offer concessions. They fear that any kind of concession that they make to the Palestinian minority could be exploited, could be seen as a sign of weakness, and could only embolden 
the Palestinians to seek more. Um, so it makes them much less willing to compromise. They don't essentially trust the Palestinian minority within Israel. There's a kind of zero-sum mentality prevailing. Um, and for this reason, they're very unwilling to give up their position of dominance because they don't trust the minority. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict also affects the attitudes of Palestinians within Israel. To the extent that Palestinians in Israel perceive the Israeli state as violently oppressing Palestinians in the territories, they're hardly likely to feel any sense of loyalty to this state or want to identify with it. They're also likely to feel some degree of antagonism toward Israeli Jews who support this occupation and Israel's military offensives against Palestinians. Um, so the conflict increases their sense of alienation vis-a-vis -vis the state and vis-a-vis -vis Israeli Jewish society. And the more this alienation increases, the more this feeds the radical forces within the Palestinian community. So the conflict weakens the desire of many Palestinian citizens to integrate into Israeli society and politics, and it strengthens their political separatism instead. The upshot of this is that as long as the conflict continues, as long as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict continues, there is very little chance of a dramatic improvement in Jewish-Palestinian relations inside Israel. So a significant improvement in Jewish-Palestinian relations depends upon a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The dilemma is that while the external Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the wider conflict, must be resolved in order for, a, in order for the internal Arab-Jewish conflict to be improved, the internal conflict makes it harder to resolve the external conflict. So just think for a minute about how the internal conflict uh, impacts the, the prospects for the resolution of the wider Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Well, the presence of a large, nationalistically conscious and politically mobilized Palestinian minority inside Israel adds a complicating factor to what is already a very complicated conflict. Um, to be clear, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be hard to resolve were it not, regardless of the presence of Palestinians inside Israel. But this is now an additional factor, and I'll just give you a couple of ways in which this plays out. One is in terms of the Netanyahu government's demand that the Palestinian Authority, or the PLO, which is the partner with whom is engaged in negotiations, recognizes Israel as a Jewish state. Essentially, the Netanyahu government, and they're not the first to, uh, to make this demand, um, says that in order for there to be a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, in order for a Palestinian state to be established, the Palestinians must recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, you know, there are many interpretations and, and uh, claims as to why Prime Minister Netanyahu has made this demand. Some see it as purely tactical, others see it as his sincere belief that it's the refusal to recognize Israel as a Jewish state that is the root of the conflict. Whatever the motivations, the fact is that this is a key demand now that the Israeli government is making. And the problem is that the Palestinian Authority is not gonna be able to agree to this demand as long as Palestinians inside Israel are refusing to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, right? So um, they cannot explicitly recognize Israel as a Jewish state against the wishes of the Palestinian minority in Israel. This would amount to an uh, act of betrayal. So it's one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, and there was also the issue of Palestinian refugees, but it's one of the reasons why the PLO and the Palestinian Authority cannot, and I, don't believe, and I believe will not, recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And therefore, without that recognition, the conflict cannot be solved. That's one way in which the internal issue aggravates the external conflict. Another uh, could occur in the demand, which has been raised but not yet made as a formal demand by the Israeli government, of some kind of exchange of territories between Israel and a future Palestinian state. According to this, um, essentially, Palestinian populated areas inside Israel, particularly in an area known as the Triangle, which borders uh, the West Bank, would be exchanged uh, in, uh, in return for Jewish populated areas inside the West Bank, the settlement blocks where the large number of settle settlers, Jewish settlers are located. Essentially, there'll be a population change. Nobody would have to move, but the borders would be redrawn. 
This is a uh, proposal that uh, Victor Lieberman has, has, has championed, uh, and many other Israeli leaders, more centrist ones, have also tentatively voiced some kind of support for this idea. Um, this, is a pr this is something that the Palestinian minority, particularly the Palestinians living in that part of Israel, um, uh, strenuously oppose. They do not want to become citizens of a future Palestinian state. They wish to remain uh, citizens within Israel. So if this becomes a, uh, a demand that uh, the Israeli government make, again, this is something that I think uh, will prevent the resolution of the conflict. So what you have then is a kind of vicious circle, right? Where the conflict exacerbates Jew the Jewish-Arab Jewish -Arab relations and Jewish-Arab tension within Israel. And the more that tension increases within Israel, the more Jewish-Palestinian relations deteriorate within Israel, the harder that makes the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The internal conflict and the external conflict are feeding into each other. The more the stalemate in one, the worse it affects the other. So as a result of this, there are a number of risks that I foresee or I would point to if the current deterioration in Jewish-Palestinian relations uh, goes on. And I will just briefly mention a few uh, risks and then uh, end by talking about what I think could be done to avert these dangers. The first risk that I see, um, and these are things that I, I think are already in some cases happening, is the trend toward Palestinian separatism within Israel. Um, by which I mean specifically the withdrawal of Palestinian minority from Israeli politics and a growing demand for political autonomy. There are already are calls for a separate Arab parliament within Israel, a separate Arab parliament. The more uh, the relations deteriorate, the stronger is that tendency toward political separatism. Um, uh, another indication of this has been the trend toward boycotting Israeli elections. In, in the past, the Palestinians were actually voted, the turnout of the Palestinians was actually higher than Israeli Jews. Now, the Palestinian turnout is just about 50%. Um, it went down from 75% in 1999, in the elections in 1999, uh, to 56% in the last election. So that's, that's about 15% lower than Jewish turnout. The more the Palestinians don't vote, the more that they decide that they've got no point in participating in Israeli politics, I think there's a real danger of uh, increasing separatism. A second danger is Jewish exclusionism, by which I mean the attempt by particularly uh, far-right Jewish individuals and parties to exclude Palestinians from participating in the Israeli political scene, the attempt to ban Palestinian Arab parties, the attempt to limit the kinds of political activities that they can do. Again, these are things already happening. In the most recent election, there was an attempt to ban two out of the three uh, Arab parties. There, those, those bans were overturned by the Supreme Court. But there is an attempt to exclude Arab parties. At the moment, the Supreme Court has been the main bastion, if you like, to uh, prevent those from succeeding. A third danger, intercommunal violence. Um, here, this particularly is a risk in mixed cities where Jews and Palestinians uh, live together in separate neighborhoods, but where they reside together. This has already occurred in a town, in a mixed town of Akka, for instance, on Yom Kippur in October 2008, when uh, hundreds of local residents of Arabs and Jews went on separate rampages through the city, attacking each other, burning each other's shops uh, and homes. This was in response to uh, an atta attack by local Jews upon an Arab resident who drove through a Jewish area uh, on, on Yom Kippur, a time which is generally when cars are generally not on the street. Um, this kind of intercommunal violence, I think, uh, could increase in the future. Another uh, danger, Arab terrorism, the uh, recruitment of uh, Palestinian citizens in, in terrorist groups, in terrorist activity, either the recruitment by groups like Hezbollah or, or, or Hamas, and they're in, in, uh, reaching out to disaffected Palestinians to get them involved, or the formation of cells uh, among Palestinians. Again, this is already happening. There have been a small number I mean, we're talking a small number within the Palestinian population as a whole, but 
um, it has been a phenomenon that has increased over the last decade. Another risk is the possibility of an Arab intifada. This is um, either a mass, a mass uprising uh, or large-scale civil disobedience. This is something that the Israeli uh, intelligence agencies are particularly worried about. Just recently, the head of uh, the equivalent of Israel's FBI warned of the danger, not of an intifada in the West Bank, but of an intifada within Israel. This is what they fear. Personally, I think there's, we're still some way from that being a serious risk because Palestinians in Israel still vividly recall uh, what happened in October 2000 and the crackdown uh, that happened afterwards. So I think at the moment they're, they're risk averse and that's unlikely to happen, but I think one can never rule that out. And we know how the first intifada started with just um, a small event that can escalate. So when the conditions are there, I think one can't be complacent about that danger. Um, another danger I would point to, and, and I think this again is something that's already occurring, but we could see in, in happening more in the future, is a fusion of the internal and external Palestinian struggles. Uh, let me explain what I mean by this. At the moment, you have essentially two separate Palestinian struggles. You have the struggle of Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem for a Palestinian state, the demand for statehood. And separate and distinct from that is the struggle of Palestinians inside Israel, the Palestinian minority, for equality, for full equality, and, as I said, for a change in the definition of the Israeli state. Two separate struggles. Palestinians inside Israel support Palestinian, the, the wider Palestinian struggle, but they don't directly participate in it. Um, in the future, however, the more that Palestinians, the Palestinian struggle for statehood um, doesn't succeed, the more the Palestinians give up the demand for an independent state, the more you could see a fusion, the merging of these two struggles. So that instead of asking for equality in Israel and a Palestinian state, Palestinians will simply demand full equality within the whole area of Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza Strip. So instead of demanding a separate state and equality, they'll demand equality within one single state, the so-called one-state solution. Um, there's already um, support for this within, among Palestinians in the West Bank. This is growing. And although most Palestinians inside Israel uh, continue to support the two-state solution, you see among the Palestinian intellectuals within Israel and political activists a growing discussion about whether these two Palestinian struggles should be merged into one. Uh, if that happens, if Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and Palestinians in Israel combine and demand a one state, um, Israeli Jews will adamantly resist this at all costs. And I think this could escalate the conflict uh, even, even greater. So there are real risks um, with, if this deterioration in relations that I've described continues. Um, let me then conclude by talking about what I think Israel should do and can do um, in order to avert these dangers and in order to improve uh, its relationship with the Palestinian minority and improve um, Jewish-Palestinian relations inside Israel. The upshot of what I'm going to be saying is that Israel can uh, significantly improve that relationship while remaining, and I want to underline this, while remaining a Jewish state. That it doesn't have to abandon its identity as a Jewish state in order to improve the relationship with Palestinian citizens. And I want to explain how that can be the case. First of all, the first thing that Israel can do, and it can do this now, is um, to really raise the economic status, to narrow the socioeconomic gap between Jews and Palestinians in Israel. Um, this can be done through long-term development plans for uh, Arab municipalities, for equalizing the financial allocations, to so ensuring that more money goes to Arab towns and villages inside Israel. Um, Israel could also solve the problems of land and housing that really uh, embitter Palestinians. Um, one of the major causes of bitterness is the fact that many Palestinians um, suffer from home demolitions because their ha homes uh, do not receive permits to be built. Avoiding these kinds of things, ensuring that 
Palestinians can get permits to build their homes, that Palestinian towns can expand, that new Palestinian communities can be established, uh, would go a long way to improving the relationship. Uh, adopting and enforcing a strict anti-discrimination policy would be uh, another thing that Israel could do today or tomorrow to uh, improve the relationship. This means not merely expressing that there should be no discrimination, but actually enforcing that aggressively, like there was a civil rights administration in, Israel, in, in the United States and ensuring that discrimination doesn't take place. Uh, instituting affirmative action programs for Palestinian citizens uh, to increase their representation in the bureaucracy, in institutions of higher education and in the business community. Uh, all of these things could uh, narrow the socioeconomic gap that I talked about earlier, and that I think would go a long way a long way to easing some of the tension that I've been describing, but it wouldn't go all the way. Um, another thing I think Israel could do uh, and should do today is um, including Palestinians in positions of po political influence, in positions of political power. This means removing, ending the, the unofficial rule against including Arab parties in Israeli coalition governments. It would make a huge difference to the future of Jewish-Palestinian relations in Israel if tomorrow uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, I will sit down with a leader of an Arab party and talk to them about joining the government. That doesn't mean to say they have to invite them into the coalition, but simply saying that they are partners to be possibly included, as the ultra-Orthodox are, who are also, by the way, not Zionist. So the, the, the rule is not against including Zion, against excluding Zionists. It's against specifically excluding uh, Arab parties. If, if, the, if Prime Minister Netanyahu tomorrow did that, that would send a very strong and powerful message to the Palestinian community in Israel that they are partners, that they are legitimate. Um, so that, I think, would go a long way to improving the situation further. So changing the political and economic conditions in which Palestinians live would, I think, uh, do a lot to reverse this deterioration. But ultimately, I don't think it would be enough. Now, I think ultimately, and this is not something I, can, I would envisage uh, the Israeli government doing tomorrow, or indeed I would recommend the Israeli government doing, to do tomorrow, but I think ultimately Israel needs to have a new social contract, a new kind of grand compromise between Israeli Jews, between the Jewish majority and the Palestinian minority. And the basic features of this social contract must be mutual recognition of their rights. What does this mean? What I mean is that Israeli Jews and the state of, and the state of Israel must recognize that Palestinians are not merely citizens of Israel, but are members of the Palestinian nation, that they are Palestinians, and therefore they should be recognized as members of a Palestinian national minority. And as such, they should be granted collective rights within Israel, group rights. The kind of group rights um, I, I think should, that should be granted are c group rights concerning primarily their education. So I'm talking about a functional autonomy over their own educational system, much like the ultra-Orthodox already enjoy in Israel. Essentially, that they would have the freedom to control their own educational system. In return for the recognition of the Palestinians as a national mi minority, deserving group rights, deserving the right to run their own uh, affairs educationally and uh, culturally. In return for that, the Palestinian minority must also recognize that the Jewish majority have rights, have collective rights, and that they are indeed the majority. I don't think it is fair to ask, uh, to demand the Jewish majority to give up their right to national self-determination. So the question is, how can we recon reconcile the, the desire and the right of Israeli Jews to national self-determination, to live in a country that reflects their Jewishness, and also acknowledge and, and, and accommodate the desire of the Palestinian minority for their group rights and collective rights? I think this apparent, uh, this, this apparent conflict can be reconciled. I think the question is not, to, not whether we should think about Israel as a Jewish state or a democracy, not whether we can think the only way Israel can accommodate the Palestinian minority is by 
ceasing to be a Jewish state, but rather thinking about what kind of a Jewish state Israel should be. Can it be a Jewish state in which the Palestinian minority has group rights, has cultural autonomy within that, educational autonomy? Um, can it be one which recognizes that it is both a homeland for the Jewish people and also a state for its citizens? So I think that although I've presented a pretty bleak uh, picture of um, where of the trajectory at the moment in terms of Jewish-Palestinian relations, um, and I've done so to uh, sound a warning bell, if you like, as to where that relationship is heading from kind of weary coexistence toward conflict, I'm also trying to uh, deliver a positive message as well, which is that we don't have to see this as necessarily a zero-sum conflict, where in order to satisfy the demands of the Palestinian mi minority, we necessarily have to give up the aspirations of the Jewish majority. I think it is possible uh, for their for there to be a mutual accommodation. Unfortunately, I think the prospects for that are pretty slim at present, but I think there are things that Israel could do now and must do now in order to pave the way for that grand compromise in the future, for that social contract. So uh, I'll end there. I want to thank you for your patience, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>Hi, Dr. Waxman. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for sharing your insights with us. Um, my question is, you touched upon this growing trend amongst um, Palestinians um, within the West Bank and Gaza and Palestinians within um, Israel proper um, trying to fuse their struggles into a common struggle. Um, and I'm wondering if um, the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip begin to realize that the two-state solution really no longer is achievable um, due to the growing um, settlement expansion in Israel, most recently approved by Netanyahu after um, Palestine uh, declared um, nationhood um, in the United Nations. Um, if they begin to declare the right to vote within Israeli elections, because ultimately Israel is the power that is occupying um, the West Bank and to a certain degree the Gaza Strip, how would Israel react to these claims for a right to vote? Would this perhaps um, compel them to, to withdraw from the West Bank and um, you know, end the siege of the Gaza Strip? No, I don't think it would compel them. I think that um, the reaction would be very negative and I think it would actually lead to um, Further, uh, I, I think, it, you know, rather than think, well, okay, we have to enfranchise Palestinians in the territories and therefore essentially create one state, one democratic state, I think the reality would be, if necessary, we will have a non-democratic minority regime. Um, the, the Jews in Israel are uh, committed to securing and defending and maintaining Israel as a Jewish state. Um, even at the cost of um, preventing, uh, even at the cost of Israeli democracy. Ultimately, Israel's value as a Jewish state is, at least according to surveys, a uh, more important value to Israeli Jews than Israel's democratic nature. So I think if, if forced to make a choice between these two, if forced to choose between being a democracy or being a Jewish state, most Israeli Jews would reluctantly, because they want Israel to be a Jewish state, certainly, uh, to be a democracy, would, would choose to, uh, to sustain Israel as a Jewish state. So I think the, if, if the Palestinian uh, struggle does become one for one state, I think that the, unfortunately, I think the outcome is likely to be bloodshed um, and is going to lead to an, an escalation of the conflict, not uh, a resolution of the conflict. Thank you. Hi. Um, it sounds like the majority of the solutions that you <coughs> suggest um, rely on the Israeli side uh, for the catalyst to change. Uh, do you think that that's something that would be more likely successful being a top-down or a bottom-up uh, uh, method of change? And what factors do you think would be uh, a catalyst to start those things happening? So, yes, you're right. I think it's incumbent upon the state of Israel uh, to um, equalize the conditions for Jews and Palestinians within Israel. Uh, and I think as the, um, 
as the dominant party, it's also incumbent upon the Jewish majority to, uh, to reach out to, to the weaker minority, in this case, the Palestinian minority. However, I don't think it's entirely a one-way uh, street. I do think there are things that the Palestinians, I said one already that I think uh, recognizing Jewish national rights, recognizing that their Jews are on majority, that they have rights, uh, one of the uh, central right being right to uh, uh, self-determination. I think recognition of Jewish rights, Jewish collective rights in Israel um, is part of what, what should be asked in return, Jews should recognize Palestinian collective rights. So I think there should be, I think that should come out of a dialogue. Ultimately, I, I think the things the government can do, um, in, in term, is particularly in the economic sphere, but I think there should be a, 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 a dialogue on, on the, on, from the bottom up, if you like, to, to particularly to, to get over some of these uh, prejudices, uh, stereotypes, perceptions on both sides that have been that have been worsening. One other thing I think um, Palestinians could do, although I don't insist upon this, and I don't think that this should be um, demanded of them, but I think it should be encouraged is to participate in some kind of national service requirement. So there's a big debate in Israel today about the about uh, military service and about trying to get ultra orthodox uh, Jews to participate in the IDF. I don't think it is uh, right or fair or, 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 or sensible to uh, demand that Palestinians uh, join the Israeli army. Um, and I don't think, in fact, that they should be forced uh, to, to do national service. Um, but I do think that encouraging them to participate in, in civil service, in, in, volu in, in volunteering, would be a way of which to strengthen their relationship with the state and demonstrate that, that they have a commitment to Israel and that they see their future within Israel. But I don't think it should be uh, framed in terms of you'll get rights if you, do, if you serve, which is the way, unfortunately, that um, some right-wing parties in Israel are framing it, that in order for Palestinians to have rights as citizens, they have to serve. Um, you don't, rights are rights. You have them by virtue, in this case, of, of being citizens. They're not something that you trade in exchange for doing military service or other kinds of civilian service. Hi. Hi, thank you for your speech. Um, you, you talked about uh, mutual recognition and um, I guess out of that mutual respect, right? So my question is like the Jewish settlements that are being built on Palestinian land are a direct infringement of Palestinian national self-determination, but it is, I guess, in, in, according to some, it would be a pursuit of Jewish national self-determination. So seeing as those are directly opposed, like given that framework, like what, what do you think is, how do you think that this mutual recognition should be achieved if the Jewish settlements continue on Palestinian lands? Well, first of all, let me, I don't think Jewish self-determination need take place over the entire area of historic Palestine, right? I mean, that's, that, that's the, I mean, Jew, the, the, the Jewish self-determination can occur within a limited geographical area, namely within the state of Israel. You don't need to exercise self-determination by settling in Palestinian areas. So I don't think Jewish self-determination and Palestinian self-determination are mutually exclusive. I think that's the principle of partition, essentially. Uh, but I agree with you that um, the continuation of, uh, of settlement building in the West Bank, I mean, this is you know, an issue concerning the wider Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but clearly um, that prevents Palestinian self-determination in the form of a statehood. Um, and so that's clearly uh, undermines the possibility for Palestinian self-determination. And as I suggested earlier, you cannot be an improvement in Jewish-Palestinian relations within Israel if the external conflict isn't solved. And in my opinion, the external conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, cannot be solved unless the Palestinians have a state. Um, so clearly, the continuation of settlement buildings is one, though it's not the only one, but it is one factor that um, is responsible for the continuation of the conflict. Dove, thank you for your nuanced presentation. Um, it is challenging to hear much of that. Um, one of the, uh, I wanted to ask two, two questions. One, to clarify, um, the Israeli uh, school educational system already has a separate uh, track, as I understand, self-determined for the 
Israeli Arab, the Israeli Palestinian population as it does for the secular Israeli population and the and multiple tracks actually within the religious uh, realm. So if you could clarify what is already being done to enable Palestinian Israelis to have their own educational system at this time. And the other question is, um, looking forward, um, within Israel, the major city of Haifa is widely considered a mixed city, although the neighborhoods may be, uh, may be somewhat uh, separated. Um, what is being done there that might be a model, a positive model for uh, Israel and integration of multiple communities uh, for now and for the future? Okay, so in terms of the education system, yes, the Arab, there is already a separate Arab education stream in Israel as there is for a secular, a national religious, religious Zionist and, and ultra-Orthodox. Um, so what I'm suggesting isn't the creation of an entirely new educational system. It's merely uh, ensuring the, that the Arab education system, in, in a sense, has uh, some uh, resembles more the ultra-Orthodox system, whereby what I mean is that they control their own education system. At, at the moment, uh, the, the content, the educational content, the curricula, is determined by a Jewish minister of education, right, who decides the Arab uh, Palestinian school children should learn the Jewish history and a Zionist narrative, essentially. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that the Palestinians be given the right, be given or rather have their right acknowledged to educate their children in according to their own history. I mean, one, one concrete example of this, uh, a few years ago, there was a big debate over the, uh, the question of whether schools should be allowed or textbooks should be permitted, which, ref which mentioned the Nakba. And essentially, a law was introduced which meant that any school or uh, municipality or state-funded institution would be fined, would receive heavy financial fines if they commemorated the, the Nakba, the, the events of 1948, as the Palestinians understand it, the, what, the Palestinian catastrophe in 1948. So this is essentially saying that Palestinians cannot teach their children their history. And I think just as ultra-Orthodox, essentially, it's not an ideal system. Maybe the ideal would have been a single education system where all Israeli citizens could attend and then would be mixed together. But we have already separate educational streams. So I'm suggesting that the Palestinians be given greater control over their educational system, much like the ultra-Orthodox already enjoy control over their educational system. Now, uh, with regards to, to Haifa, yeah, Haifa is one of the better uh, mixed cities, perhaps the model mixed city in terms of uh, coexistence between the two communities. Um, I think a large part of that um, has to do with the actions of the municipality. Right? And this is one of, the, one, one of the things we could learn, is that it's not just about what the national government does. I mean, if you look at the, the policies of the, and the actions of the Netanyahu government um, and the, the last Knesset, it's been, in terms of Jewish-Arab relations, disastrous. I mean, there's just been a slew of legislation which is basically directly or indirectly targeted um, the, the Palestinian minority within Israel and certainly made them feel that they were being targeted and that this legislation was basically aimed at, uh, at, at gradually undermining their position within Israeli society. At the same time, on the municipal level, uh, what's happened has actually been a active uh, improvement uh, partly through having citizen groups, civil society groups come together and solve problems and, and, and work out where these two communities can work together. And Haifa is an example of that. So um, on the political level, what I've been describing is unfortunately deterioration in relations. But, but there are cases where the two communities can coexist and do coexist and have done for a long time, which I think is the point I'm making, that we don't have to think of Jews and Palestinians as destined or as doomed to conflict, right? That they can coexist, and we have to think about what are the conditions to make that possible. 